Welcome. I hope you're doing well in the Lord today. In this video, I just want to walk through and take my time to walk through Romans chapter 2. Yesterday, I did a video uh, and I touched a lot on Romans chapter 2, touched a little bit on the context. Uh, but in, in light of that video, I want to go ahead and really focus in on verse by verse in Romans chapter 2. I've looked at Romans chapter 2 in the past when I was dealing with the issue of Calvinism, and I kind of went section by section through Romans chapter 2, but really I want, to, I want to get into the details today and look verse by verse throughout the entire chapter. Now, one of the reasons I was thinking about this and, and the need to go through this was just because if you understand Romans chapter 2, not in a hypothetical way as something that can't exist or that's not apl applicable to Christians, then you would understand the mindset of the early church. The early church writings, the pre-Nicene writings, uh, whether it be uh, Irenaeus or uh, Tertullian or uh, Justin Martyr or others, if you read through their writings, they have this perspective on the Christian faith, that yes, we are brought into a relationship with God by grace through faith, but then we are expected to walk in obedience to the law of God, the law of Jesus Christ, and that we will be judged on the last day according to our works. Now, in a Protestant mindset, this is anathema, which is why many people will say, oh no, that's just hypothetical, it can't take place. But when we walk through the context of the scripture itself, we see that it actually makes great sense and opens up a lot of the scripture to us. Because when somebody is stuck on the kind of the Protestant idea of that it's by faith alone, it's by faith alone, and they, they have to emphasize that, and they think that that is what orthodoxy is. Actually, orthodoxy comes from the beginning of the church, not 1,500 years later, not in the time of Martin Luther and John Calvin, but it comes in the time of men like Justin Martyr and, uh, and the other men that I mentioned. And so when we understand it, when we understand the context, we'll be able to understand what is actually be sa being said. But like I said, a lot of times this, this mindset of it's by faith alone, even though the scripture says in James chapter 2, I believe, it says that so that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. That's the only time faith alone, by faith alone, is used in the scripture. And so this can be something so radical to our thinking, but when we understand it, we'll be able to understand so many passages of scripture that we've had to kind of hide from in the past. But when they're opened up to us and we're able to understand how faith and works, to, works work together, how grace is not contrary to walking in obedience to Jesus Christ, and how these things work together in the scripture and in the mindset of the early church according to true orthodoxy, then we will not uh, be so confused. And when I mention orthodoxy, I'm not talking about Eastern orthodoxy that's gotten involved in worshiping icons and all kinds of, uh, you know, praying to saints and all different kinds of idolatries. I'm talking about the fact that the early church had the, the gospel that was once for all handed down to the church and they were faithful to keep it and it started to be changed around the time of Constantine. And so we want to go through this. Now, one thing I was thinking just funny as I was, I was watching one of my old videos because I was looking at through it for uh, to send to somebody about Anabaptism. And so sometimes I men mention the Anabaptist faith or the perspective that Anabaptists have. And I would consider myself from that perspective, uh, not from a, a Reformed or from a Lutheran perspective, but the Anabaptists were the kind of the third choice during the Reformation. There's Catholic, there's the magisterial reformers, and then there were the Anabaptists. And as I was watching it, I noticed that I have a goatee. And so really, if you want to know why I'm growing a goatee, it has nothing to do with doctrine, has nothing to do with my view, because a lot of people in the Anabaptist movement, Mennonites and stuff, believe in having beards. Actually, I just want to get my beard long enough that I can fit the uh, Taliban requirements in the, the days of the Taliban originally in order if you were walking through the streets and you were uh, a man you would have to, they would test you to see whether your beard was actually long enough according to Islamic standard and so you had to grab your beard and then as long as it came out the bottom of your fist then you were good so I'm really just doing this as an experiment it's not a doctrine so in case anybody was wondering as thinking oh this this Mennonite guy must uh you really be going for it with the beard. No, it'll probably be chopped off as soon as I get sick of it. So that's not an issue. Just a funny thought that I was considering. Let's go ahead and jump into Romans chapter 2. And I'm just going to go verse by verse. Uh, I'm going to try not to jump ahead, uh, though sometimes I'll have to kind of mention something that's coming later in the chapter to be able to make that connection. But I'm going to try to do as best as I can just kind of uh, go through it. Now, it's going to start off in verse 1. Therefore, you are without excuse, O man, whoever you are who judges, for when you judge another, you condemn yourself. 
for you who judge do the same thing. So we need to ask the question, who is this talking about? Paul had begun in Romans chapter 1, particularly verse 16, in giving the theme of Romans, which is that uh, the gospel is the power of God for salvation to all who believe, for the Jew first, but also for the Greek. And so for righteousness is, of God is revealed from faith to faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith. And so we recognize that in Romans, Paul is dealing with the issue of Jew and Gentile, particularly in the Roman church. There were Jews and Gent Jew and Gentile believers. And later in Romans chapter 14, you'll see some of the conflict that they had about days and about uh, eating food from the market and different things. So who is he talking to here when he talks about men who judge other people for doing wrong, but they do it themselves? If we jump back to the verse proceeding in chapter 1, in Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 18, Paul goes ahead and he condemns the idolatry and then the sinfulness of the Gentiles. He talks that they are condemned because of their idolatry and that they've been handed over to wickedness because of that. But he concludes with this, verse 32, who know the righteous requirement of God that those who commit such things are worthy of death. They not only do them, but also give heartily approval to those who practice them. So the Gentiles were though that in their, in their conscience, According to creation, they knew what was right and wrong, and they knew that they were guilty of acts done that were worthy of death. But not only did they practice them, they also agreed with others practicing them. And so we see that the Gentiles didn't condemn others for doing evil. But here in Romans chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore you are without excuse, O man, whoever you are who judges. For when you judge another, you condemn yourselves. For you who judge do the same thing. So we need to understand in the context that Paul is here speaking of the Jews. He's going to explain that even though they have the law, they are still condemned by the law because they do not obey it. If we go on to verse 2, let me note this. In Romans chapter 9, you'll notice whenever Paul is arguing with the Jews, he also says, Who are you, O man, to argue against God? And so this phrase, O man, is something in, in the book of Romans that's referring to the unbelieving Jews. Verse 2, But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who commit such things. So we've already entered into the idea that God is going to judge people for the acts that they commit. The judgment of God is according to truth against those who commit such things. So they were doing evil. It's not just an idea that they had that was wrong. It's not just that they had the wrong faith or the wrong understanding of something. They were committing acts that were going to be judged by God. Verse 3, Do you think, O man, who judges those who do such thing, things and who does the same thing that you will escape the judgment of God. So here he's speaking to the Jews and he's unbelieving Jews and he's saying, look, you take your boast in the law. You think that you are, are special because you have the law of Moses and yet you do not obey it and it is going to judge you. And so don't think that you will escape the judgment of God just because you have the law of Moses and because you are children of Abraham according to the flesh. Verse four. Do you despise the riches of his goodness, tolerance, and patience, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Now, if we jump over here to Romans chapter 9, because he brings this topic up again later. I'm going to try as best I can to stick in, in Romans, but we'll see sometimes uh, things will be clarified from other passages. But if we flip over to Romans chapter 9, we'll see in verse 22. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? So he'd endured them with patience. So this is the same ones he's talking about in Romans chapter 2. Do you not despise the riches of his goodness, tolerance, and patience, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Now, what does this mean that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Nowadays, many will say, oh, the goodness of God leading you to repent means we just preach the love of God and that will touch people's hearts and then they will repent. That's not what it means. If we flip back to Revelation, Revelation chapter 2, let's see here. Revelation chapter 2, okay, let's, let's go ahead and start in verse 23. Or start in verse 20. But I have a few things against you. Now, this is written to the churches. So this is written to people that are at least claiming to be Christians in the church. But I have a few things against you. You permit that, that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, but she did not repent. So this giving her time to repent, this is the patience and the kindness of God desiring to lead her to repentance. Okay? 
And just for clarity's sake, I'll finish the passage. Look, I will throw her onto a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will put her children to death and all the churches shall know that I am the one who searches the hearts and minds. I will give to each one according to your deeds. So here, Jesus judges the hearts and minds of the church and he will give to each according to their, their deeds. As we see also, and we'll probably note later at the, the last chapter of the book of Revelation that he's coming, his reward is with him to give everyone according to his deeds. So here back in Romans chapter two, Verse four, the, the riches and the kindness and the goodness of God is that God in his patience doesn't bring judgment. It's not about us preaching the love of God only. It's about that in his patience and his kindness and his goodness, he is leading us to repentance. He's giving us time to repent. He's granting us the open door of repentance. Verse five, but because of your hardness and impenitent heart, you are storing up treasures of wrath against yourself on the day of wrath when the righteous judgment of God will be revealed. So again, keep in mind, he's talking to the unbelieving Jews of his day that were refusing to repent. They were judging the wicked Gentiles, but they were practicing the same things themselves and they were refusing to trust in Jesus Christ. And here it says that they were storing up wrath for themselves on the day of wrath and judgment of Jesus Christ. Uh, now, if we turn back again to Romans chapter nine, making this connection, when he was talking uh, in Romans chapter nine, let's see, verse 22, what if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known endure with much patience the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? So this verse 22, talking about the Jews in the argument in Romans chapter nine, uh, that, that Paul is going through talking with the unbelieving Jews that have rejected Messiah is the same context and the same idea that's happening right here in Romans chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Do you despise the riches of his goodness, tolerance, and patience, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance, but because of your hardness and impenitent heart, you are storing up treasures of wrath against yourself on the day of wrath when the righteous judgment of God will be revealed? Who are the vessels of wrath? In particular, in Romans chapter 9, verse 22, and the ones he's talking to here, the same ones, they are the unbelieving Jews, those that have rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And he goes on, the sentence actually continues on in verse 6, and he will render to every man according to his deeds. The scripture is very clear. The New Testament is very clear. We are going to be judged according to what we have done. We can look over and over again. Uh, we could go to 1 Peter it says that if you call on him, uh, him if you call him Father, uh, who judges each man impartially according to his deeds, live each live your life in fear, uh, in in godly fear. So we understand that that's talking to believers that they're to live in godly fear because God will judge each man impartially according to his deeds. Of Revelation, Revelation chapter twenty-two, Revelation twenty-two, Jesus closes with a very clear warning. In verse 12, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me to give to each according to his work. So Jesus Christ is coming to give each according to his work. And we're going to see this further as we go on in this passage. So I'll, I'll let that suffice for the amount of verses thus far. So he will render to every man according to his deeds. You and I, whoever we are, are going to be judged according to our deeds. Now we might say, but that doesn't, well, but what about by grace through faith? Grace through faith is still there. The issue is how do we understand and connect those two things together? We don't say, well, saved by grace through faith, so this can't be talking about Christians being judged by their deeds. No, that's a bad way to read scripture. Whenever we read something that's clear in scripture and then we go somewhere else and we think, well, that seems to contradict with what's clear. And then we say, well, okay, then I'm just gonna throw out the unclear. That's not how we study scripture. We take all of scripture, we read it. Uh, those that are in the dispensationalist camp will say, look, we need to take the literal meaning of the scripture. So here we are. Let's take the literal meaning that it says that, uh, and he will render to every man, not to some men, not to uh, only unbelieving men, not to just Jews, not to just Gentiles, but to every man, he will render to every man according to his deeds. This is the the solid testimony throughout the New Testament scripture to rip that out, to throw it into some different dispensation or a different kind of judgment or, or some kind of thing and split the judgments and, and make them different. This is not a good reading of scripture. It's very clear. Let's go on. Verse seven, to those who by patiently doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality will be eternal life. So, this is the real crux, and this is why people want to throw out what Paul says here and make it hypothetical. So they'll come in with certain doctrines, first of all, that, oh, there's no way that anybody can do good. Okay, well, that's partly true. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Okay, so 
let's just kind of infer into this passage, to those who by patient continually doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality will be eternal life. If these people really exist, if this is not hypothetical, then they would have to be believers because as Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. So we can't bear good fruit apart from Jesus Christ. Uh, Romans chapter 8 verse 13 says that whoever lives according to the flesh will die, but whoever by the Spirit puts to death the misdeeds of the body will live. So only those that have the Spirit of God can live by the Spirit of God. Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 and 8 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Well, whoever sows to the flesh will reap corruption, that is death. And whoever sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life. So from those passages alone and from our understanding of what Jesus said in John chapter 15, that apart from him we can do nothing, we can conclude, and we're just going to conclude partially at this point, we'll get into it more later as we go through the passage, that this is probably talking about believers. To those who by patiently, uh, patiently doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality will be eternal life. Now the next question comes, so... You're saying that they are perfect, that they live perfectly because God demands absolute perfection. The verse doesn't say that. We don't read that. That's not what is written in the scripture. Uh, it doesn't say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, and do it perfectly without fail. No, it says this is our law that we are to walk in. So to do good, to patiently, by patiently doing good, seeking for glory, honor, and immortality. This is really a great verse to be able to understand the, just the practical of how a Christian lives his life that we are always seeking, we're always hunger and, uh, hungry and thirsty for righteousness. We're always pursuing the kingdom of God and his righteousness. This is what we seek first. This is what we're chasing after. It's not that we're chasing it perfectly. It's not that we uh, do it without fail. It's not sinless perfectionism, but it is the, the attitude of a heart of someone that has been born again and that is in right relationship with Jesus Christ, they will be pursuing glory, honor, and immortality. The goal of our life is the kingdom of God. The goal of our life is to honor the will of God and to honor Jesus Christ. And so this is the, the, main, uh, the main focus of our life, and this passage shows that well. Now, the other thing that will come up in uh, the, you know, the mindset uh, of the magisterial reformers, Luther, Calvin, and those that have been greatly influenced by them, uh, even among the Baptists who have uh, a lot in common with the Anabaptists, the, the mindset that, oh, wait, no, 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 this, this can't be, then you would be earning your salvation. Well, Paul is the one that spoke so strongly against earning our salvation. In chapter 3, he's going to go into that again, and he's going to go into that in many places in the book of Romans itself. So obviously, Paul is not saying we're earning our salvation by continuance in doing good. So what does it mean that we're going to be judged by our works and those that do good will receive eternal life? Does that mean that they earn eternal life? No, it means that they have a faith. As it says in Galatians chapter 5, again, it's Paul's writings, Galatians chapter 5, verse 2, or maybe verse 6, I'm sorry. He says, he says, so circumcision doesn't matter, uncircumcision do doesn't matter. But what matters is faith working through love. So faith that works through love is what matters. So a Christian, his goal is the, the law of Christ to love God and to love his neighbor as himself. And he works at that. It doesn't just flow out as kind of a natural consequence, something that God divinely determines and then it'll just happen in their life. No, that it's something that they work to do. It's something that they choose to do, but it starts with faith. As they place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they trust him. Let me use an example. Naaman, uh, the, the Syrian who was a leper in the time of Elijah, or Elisha, I'm not sure which, he, he, he heard he was, he, was, he was cursed with the leprosy or he had the leprosy, and he heard from his servant girl that there was a prophet in Israel and a God in Israel that could heal him. So he heard that and he had faith and, and went all the way, announcement, neighborhood announcement. And he went all the way to Israel. He went to the king and then eventually ended up at the door of Elijah. And uh, he went this way by faith. The, the faith moved him to go all the way to Israel. But then the... The prophet sent somebody out and said, look, go wash seven times in the river. And at first he was upset about doing this. Why do I go to the Jordan River? It's a dirty river. But in the end, he determines with the help of another servant that tells him, look, if it was a great thing, you would just go do it. But now go do something so simple. So he went to the Jordan and he dipped himself seven times in the river and he was healed. Now, when we hear that, do we think that he earned his healing by dipping himself seven times in the river? No, we don't. What we see is that God spoke his word through the prophet and that 
Na Naaman, he had faith in the word of God and that, and that he worked that out and he walked it out in action. So faith works. Faith does something. Faith obeys. And so when somebody is walking in faith with Jesus Christ, what will they do? They will, by patiently doing good, seek for glory, honor, and immortality will be eternal life. This is what they will do. They will seek God. They will seek his kingdom and his righteousness. That's what faith is. That's the result of faith. If we believe in Jesus Christ as Lord, if we believe his word, if we believe that his words are eternal life, then we will follow his words. Somebody that says, I believe in Jesus Christ, but I don't believe in all the warnings that those that live according to the flesh will die. I don't believe in all the warnings or, or the promises that those that uh, put sin to death by the power of the Holy Spirit will live. I don't believe in all those. I just believe that I believe Jesus died for my sins and so I'm going to heaven. They're not believing the word of God. You either believe it all or you don't believe it at all. So we need to understand that whenever we trust in Christ, we will trust his word and we will act in this way. Now, uh, I'll read this. Verse 8. But to those who are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath will be tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man who does evil to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. So here, how many people that are doing evil are going to receive it? Only those that are unbelieving and do evil? No. It says to the, upon every soul of man who does evil. That means whether they claim to be a Christian, whether they claim to uh, have believed in Jesus or not, they will be judged by the evil that they have done and they will be condemned if they walked in evil. If they walked according to the flesh, they will die. If they walk according to the spirit, putting sin to death, they will live. Let's go a little bit further because it continues on the same vein here. Verse 10, but glory on, oh, sorry, did I go? Yeah, yeah, okay. And that was Jew and Gentile. So both Jew and Gentile that do evil will face the wrath of God. Those that do good, which we're temporarily assuming means believers in, in verse 7, will have eternal life. Verse 10, but glory, honor, and peace will be to every man who does good work to the Jew first and to the Gentile, for there is no partiality with God. Now there's again that no partiality with God that we, uh, we referenced in 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, let's go ahead and turn there so we see that clearly. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. But he, as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all your conduct. So this is something we're supposed to do. God called us. We're supposed to walk in holy conduct because it is written, be, be holy for I am holy. What are the consequences if we do not walk in that holiness? Because in Hebrews it says that without holiness no man will see the Lord. Verse 17, and if you address as father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your sojourning. So we will be judged according to our works. Going back to Romans chapter two, but glory, honor, and peace will be to every man, not some men, not only those that believe, not only those that disbelieve, but to every man who does good work. To the Jew first and then to the Gentile, for there is no partiality with God. Now we say, ah, but where did Paul get this? I mean, this really has to be something maybe was added later or it's for a different dispensation or, oh, it is just hypothetical because we could never do that. Uh, all the ways that are, are used to get around this passage of scripture, you know, and we think, well, where did this come from? Well, it came from the teaching of Jesus Christ. If we flip back over to John chapter five, if you want to understand what an Anabaptist perspective is in in distinction to uh, the rest of the Reformation. Uh, if you want to really understand, it's it's not even only really focused in on baptism and believers' baptism. But if you really want to understand the theological difference between the two systems, between Luther and, and Calvin and Zwingli and their system versus the Anabaptist reform, reformers, uh, many of them which, which were, were killed and persecuted by the other reformers. But if you really want to know the difference, the difference is that when, when those like Luther come to the scripture, especially the New Testament, they read the scripture through things like the book of Romans or through the writings of Paul. They understand Paul first with all his theological terms and all of his intricacies, and then they go back and they read the rest of the, the New Testament. They read uh, Jesus in the, the, in the Gospels and those things. But 
an Anabaptist, an Anabaptist perspective comes first to the teachings of Jesus Christ. It's the beginning of the New Testament. It's the, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that taught the disciples. He's the one that was the master teacher that had the clearest teaching, the simplest teaching, the most straightforward teaching. He was perfect. He is Lord. He is God. It is his commands that we are to obey. And so when we go and we read through the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John first, and then we come to understand Romans and Galatians and Ephesians and Colossians and, and Peter and James, then we will understand very clearly what they're saying because they're teaching the same uh, things that the master taught. John chapter 5, verse uh, 28. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. So, again, there's coming a day when God, Jesus is going to raise the dead. Now, we're going to see that he's not only going to raise people to eternal life, but eternal death as well. He's going to raise them to life. Who, how many people are going to be involved in this? It says, For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. Believers and unbelievers, they all die. And all of them are going to be raised up, but they're going to be raised up to eternal life or eternal death. And let's look at what he continues to say in verse 29. And come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So everybody in the grave, both believer and unbeliever, are going to be raised from the dead, those that have done good to everlasting life, those that have done evil to everlasting judgment. We can't say that believers are not involved in this. We can't say that believers are judged by some different standard. We can't say, no, no, they were only judged by their faith, not by what they did. But Jesus said they were judged by what they did. Okay, then it's not talking about believers. It's only talking about uh, the unbelievers that are in their grave. So some of the unbelievers that are in gra their grave because they did good are going to have eternal life. No, the scripture is very, very clear. Jesus' teaching is very, very clear. And when we flip back to Romans chapter 2, we understand why Paul said what he said. To those who by patiently doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality will be eternal life. But to those who are contentious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath will be tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man, all that are in their grave, who does evil to the Jew first and to the Greek, Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace will be to every man, everyone in the grave, who does good work to the Jew first and to the Gentile, for there is no partiality with God. So I hope we're seeing that this is not something out of the normal. This is, this is the teaching of Jesus Christ, and Paul, as a faithful servant, is relating that information in the same way. People get confused because Paul talks so often against the, Gen the, the Judaizers who were seeking to be justified and be, be right with God by obeying the law of Moses that they come to passage like this and they can't have any understanding of what he is talking about because they're so stuck on one side of the issue and not the whole picture. Let's move on with verse 12. As many as have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and as many as have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. So, what do we see here? Those that have sinned in the law. So this confirms again what we already read back that in, in, in verses 1 through 5, that it's about the Jews who are under the law. So those that are under the law but have sinned in the law, they've said that's wrong and they condemn other people for doing it, but they themselves break the law. They will be judged. They will perish without, uh, or they will perish under the law. But those who don't have the law and have sinned without the law, they will perish without the law. So Jew and Gentile who live in rebellion to God, uh, that that don't obey the truth, that don't patiently seek for glory, honor, and mortality, but are contentious and do not obey the truth, but unrighteous and indignation and wrath will be upon them. Okay, every soul that does evil will perish. Every soul that does good will have eternal life. So it's at this point where I say, yeah, see, that's why it's hypothetical. Is because the only thing people can do is sin against God. And that's all they can do. So whether Jew or Gentile, they are condemned. It's true. All Jew and Gentile, they are all sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But there are certain people that have repented trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, received the Spirit of God, been made new on the inside, a new creation, and it began to walk in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not in perfection, but seeking for glory, honor, and immortality patiently. They're doing good. And so this is the people that's being discussed, as we'll see. Verse 13. So we had, in verse 12, it says, Gentiles that disobeyed God's uh, uh, 
God, that God's righteousness, that they lived in sin, like chapter 1, verse 18 through the end of the chapter it was talking about, and then also those under the law who have sinned knowingly against the law. Now, verse 13, for the hearers of the law are not justified before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. So for us, that's like, whoa. So is Paul here saying that we're going to be justified by obeying the law of Moses? Now we'll get to it soon. And we'll be able to see clearly that no, Paul has a distinction between the law of God and the law of Moses, between the letter of the law and the righteousness of the law. So we'll, we'll put that off for just a minute, which law he's particularly talking about here, because one is the fulfillment of the other. And so Paul will often mix when he's talking about, it's like us talking about uh, Jesus as the lamb of God. Well, he's not a lamb. But he is a lamb because he fulfilled the promises of the Old Testament about a lamb that was sacrificed for our sin. And so we, so Paul also talks about the law in that way. He'll talk about the law, the fulfilled law in Jesus Christ, the law of Christ. But he'll refer to it with the language of the type and shadow, which is the old law, the law of Moses. But we'll, we'll get to that as we go through the passage. But, but here it says, the hearers of the law are not justified before God. Now, if you have an ESV, it will say, for the hearers of the law are righteous before God. So those that are doing the law are the ones that are righteous in the sight of God. So that's what justified means. It means to be righteous, to be in right standing with. So for the hearers of the law are not justified or in right standing before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Okay? Will be justified. So this is talking about future. Now in this context, what has he been talking about that is a future thing? What is it that is is future. It's the judgment that is to come. That's where we started in verse uh, 6. And he will render to every man according to his deeds. That's future tense. And so who is going to be counted and justified and counted righteous on the day of Jesus Christ? It's going to be those that heard and obeyed the law. Those that kept the law. Not just those that heard it, but those that did it. Now first, let's go ahead and flip over to uh, 1 John chapter 3. Because there is such a mindset that, no, no, we're not righteous. We're not righteous. We're only righteous in, in action, because to, or in, in, in faith and in position. Because to be righteous would mean to have perfection. No, that's not what being righteous in God's eyes means. Yes, we are forgiven of our sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. We come to him and our past sins are forgiven. But then we walk in obedience to him, not perfectly, but we walk in right relationship with him. We are righteous before him. Not perfectly righteous, but we are righteous and we are leaning on the Savior that we can come to the throne of grace when we do fail and we have an advocate with the Father. And so it's a relational covenant. But let's go and switch over to 1 John chapter 3, verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who does righteousness is righteous, just as Christ is righteous. Whoever practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was revealed that he might destroy the works of the devil. This passage is so clear that those that practice righteousness, not something that they just believe, not just a position that they have, but they walk in righteousness, they walk in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, a faith that works through love. They walk in that and they are righteous in the sight of God. Are they perfect? Are they without flaw? No, again, they are not, but they are righteous. They're walking in the new covenant. They're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. As it said in, uh, not to get too far off track here, but to so that we're clear here. Verse 5, This then is the message which we have heard in him and declare to you that God is light, verse chapter 1, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So as long as we're walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, we're walking in honesty, we're seeking after glory, honor, and immortality. When we fall, we get back up, we come to the throne of grace, we receive mercy and help in time of need. As long as we're walking, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. We're walking with our high priest who is a perfect advocate, able to save to the uttermost those that come to him because he ever lives to make intercession. And so we walk in un- uh, we, we walk in fellowship with God and we walk covered by the blood of Jesus Christ in this covenant relationship, okay? So those who practice, first, chapter three, those who practice righteousness are righteous. Going back to chapter two. For the hearers of the law are not justified before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. They will be declared righteous. They will be found 
not guilty on that day. Now, let's look at another passage that maybe we overlook and maybe we haven't noticed in Matthew chapter 12. Because you say, no, 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 we're justified now and it's once and it's forever. No, justification is our relationship with God. Yes, we were justified when we believed in Jesus Christ. Our sins were forgiven. We were made in right standing with God. We were brought into relationship with God, reconciled to God. But then we need to keep walking with God. It's not that, okay, I had this one time, I got this little stamp of approval, and now I'm good to go no matter what I do after that. No, if you walk away from God, then the Bible says, if you deny him, he will deny you. Because he is faithful to himself, he will not deny himself. He will deny you instead. And so we need to continue to walk with him, not just walk with him at one time. So justification is not this transaction once for all. We, we make a transaction and the deal is done. No, justification is through walking in relationship with God. That we're in right standing with God because we're in right standing with his son Jesus Christ. Not through perfection, but through a, a faith that works through love. Let's go to John chapter 12, or Matthew chapter 12, and see this. What about on the day of judgment? So we're going to be justified on the day of judgment? But aren't we justified yet now? Yes, if we're walking with Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. But on that day, we're going to be judged by whether we were walking with Christ. Let's look at an example here. Jesus uses the same terminology, and Paul, as a good student and disciple, is teaching the same thing. Let's see if I can find it here. Okay, starting in verse 36. But I say to you that for every idle word that men speak, they will give an account on the day of judgment. So we're talking about a future thing, something that's going to happen on the day of judgment. Okay, and then he goes on. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So we know that the judgment of God is more than just our words, but everything that we do, it's according that he will search the secrets of men's hearts according to uh, the, the gospel of Paul. That he, He's going to search our hearts. He's going to try our hearts. So it's not just our words, but here we see very clearly, on the day of judgment, a future event that men, according to their words, are either going to be justified or they're going to be condemned. Okay, so every idle word, all the idle words that they spoke, every... All the things that we speak out, we are going to be judged for that. Now I say, oh, but, well, I've already spoken too many idle words. Indeed, we have. That's why we need to continually come back to the throne of grace and receive mercy and forgiveness. And so I just want us to see here that Jesus says, for by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. What you have done, you are going to be judged by that. And you will be found innocent or guilty according to that. I understand this is not a mindset that we're used to, but if we go back to the early church teaching, this was very clear. They were all in agreement on this. There was no debate on this issue for hundreds of years in the early church. They all taught this. The, the reformers also completely agreed with this. Not the false reformers, not the men who liked political power like Luther and Calvin and Zwingli, not those who persecuted other people because of their beliefs, not those men who were violent men and uh, you know worldly men like those men. No, 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 those are not reformers. Those are false reformers. But according to all the true reformers, they agree with this. Men like... Uh, you know, Grable, uh, men like uh, Ma Michael Sattler, men like Menno Simons, they were in 100% agreement. So the early church and the true reformers of the Anabaptists all agreed that this was true, that Jesus' words were true, that you will be justified by your words and you will be condemned by your words. That on that day, everybody in the grave will hear the voice of the Son of God and come out, those who have done good to everlasting life, those who have done evil to everlasting judgment. So uh, it might be time for us to really consider that, wait a second, maybe there's not only, you know, Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, and uh, Protestant. Maybe there's something else. Maybe there was a real pure Reformation that happened that the that you don't read very much about because they were all slaughtered by, by Catholic and by Protestant alike. And so there's not much writings by them because there's not many writings by them because many of the leaders were killed too quickly. Uh, if you are interested in reading, I encourage you to go to Kindle. You can get... Uh, the complete works of Menno Simons, I think it's like $3. Uh, you can get a Kindle version of that for $3 and just start reading and you will see a distinct difference. They, they, difference. they call out the hypocrisy and the loose living of the, the, the Lutherans and the, the Calvinists. They, they call that out. They speak it clearly and then they condemn the idolatry and all the uh, priestcraft 
of the, the popes. And then they call to live uh, humble lives, not persecuting others, willing to suffer for Christ, willing to confess Christ. It's a it's a quite a distinct different from those that wanted to be little popes over Germany or little popes over uh, Geneva or little popes over Switzerland or other areas. And so uh, I encourage you to look into that. But go back to the scripture. That was a that was a tangent if there ever was one. Okay. Verse chapter two, Romans two, verse thirteen. For the hearers of the law are not justified before God but the doers of the law will be justified. So those who are not walking in obedience to Jesus Christ are not standing in, in righteous standard with him because it's those who do righteousness, practice righteousness that are righteous. And on the day of judgment, the doers of the law will be declared righteous and God's people, not others that have lived in rebellion, no matter what they confess. Verse 14, for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do by nature the things contained in the law. These ha not having the law are a law unto themselves who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness while their conflicting thoughts e e accuse or even excuse them. In the day when according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. So let's work through this. So now he's switching. He's talked about those that uh, were under the law and didn't obey it, those were without the law and sinned against God. And now he's talking about these this other group of people that are Gentiles that by nature obeyed the law, that by nature they did what was required in the law of Moses. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do by nature the things contained in the law, these not having the law are a law unto themselves. So they're in a distinct category. Now this is not talking about... Uh, Somebody, uh, some lost tribe off somewhere in, you know, Bedouin tribe in, in uh, you know, North Africa somewhere that they just happen to live a good life and a conscious life. No, they're not by nature living and walking for God. They're living according to their flesh. Okay, so what is this by nature? It goes on and tells us in verse 15, who show the work of the law written in their hearts. Now, is this their conscience? No, because it says their conscience also bearing witness while their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So we have two things. They have the law written on their hearts. Okay, this is language of the new covenant. This is the promised new covenant. Uh, if we turn to Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, verse 31, I believe. Surely the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. It will not be according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, although I was a husband to them, says the Lord. So this is a covenant with Israel. The new covenant is with Israel. But as Paul is arguing throughout the book of Romans, Romans chapter 4, he says, how do we become children of Abraham and become part of Israel? By faith in Jesus Christ. And those who don't believe that are actually descended from the uh, Abraham are cut off and they're cast out. This is what Romans chapter 9 through 11 is all about. But here, this is new covenant is promised. Verse 33, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and write it in their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. They shall teach no man more every man his neighbor and every man saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I'll remember their sin no more. In the new covenant, We've received the Spirit of God and the law has been written on our heart. We have been adopted, we've been engrafted into the people of God and we have received this promise, though we were Gentiles. And now we don't go around to other Christians telling them, you need to know God. No, if somebody doesn't know God, they don't have eternal life because Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse three, that this is eternal life to know the one true God, Christ, one true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. And so we see very clearly that all the people in the new covenant know the Lord. They know him. And so we see that this covenant that he will, I will put my law within them and I will write it in their hearts. This is what is being spoken about here in Romans chapter 2. We also see it if we could flip over to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36 verse, see, we'll just start here in... Uh, 26. Also, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. In other words, those who by nature 
because they've received a new nature, they've received the Spirit of God, the law is written in their heart, who by nature do the, obey the law. That's what was being spoken about here in, in Romans chapter uh, 2. Verse, let's look at it again here. Verse 14, for when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these not having the law are a law unto themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, not in their conscience, their conscience then, their conscience also bearing witness. So their conscience is here and the law written on their hearts is something that is a work of the spirit of God. The only ones that have the, those, the law of God written on their hearts are those that are in the new covenant. We'll see this further clarified by the end of the chapter. So this passage is about Christians. It's about those that are in the new covenant, particularly he's focusing in on the Gentiles. And then he says this, while conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. Let's jump over to 1 John 3 again and see what he's talking about here because we think, well, why should they be, you know, why should their conscience be wrestling? Shouldn't they just like believe that they were saved once and it's, it's, it's good forever and no matter what they do after that? No. Let's go to start in verse 19. By this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Our hearts that are conflicted whenever we know that we're sinning against God and living in rebellion or when we know when we're submitting to him and asking for grace. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knows everything. I've heard this quoted to say, see, our hearts condemn us, but God won't condemn us because he's greater. That's not what this is saying. This is saying, if our conscience is clear, if we are clear that we are walking with the Lord, then we can be confident that God knows we are walking with him. Okay, so if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart knows everything. So if we condemn ourselves, our conscience is guilty, then we know that God knows it also. And so we need to come to him and we need to repent. Verse 21, beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, then we have confidence before God. So if our conscience is clear, then we have confidence before God. Whenever we have secret sins, when we are compromising, we know that we are living in sin, we are in danger and our hearts know it and God knows it. And this is a dangerous place to be. And whatever we ask, we will receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Remember, this is the same chapter that said, don't be deceived. He who practices righteousness is righteous. Okay? And Jesus came to destroy the works of sin. So this commandments, not one commandment, not just to believe, but his commandments. Okay? Uh, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. So that's one of his commandments. And love one another as he has commanded us. What are his commands? to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself, to believe on Jesus Christ. And so these are all incorporated in this, not just believe. Some people will come to this passage and say, no, no, no. When it talks about his commandments, it's only talking about the one commandment, to obey the command to believe. That's not true. It says very clear here, to obey the command to love, the royal law of scripture. Uh, let's go back to Romans chapter two. Excuse or even excuse them, verse 16. In the day when according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. So here we see it. This is Paul talking about his gospel. And his gospel includes that there's going to come a day when he's going to judge the world in righteousness. As it says in Acts chapter 17, his conclusion the, in his sermon whenever he preached in among the Greeks in Athens, chapter 17, verse 30 maybe, chapter 17, Verse 32, when they heard the resurrection, I'm sorry, we'll go back a little bit before. Verse 29, therefore, since we are offspring of God, we ought not to suppose that the deity is like gold or silver or stone or an engraved work of art <coughs> or an image of a reflection of men. So this is idolatry. Now, God hates idolatry. This is not just unbelief. He's not going to just call them to, to, from unbelieving to believe. Unbelief is rebellion. We saw that in Romans chapter 1. It says that they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So these men were not just simply unbelieving in God. They were sinful. I say this because those in the, some in the so-called free grace movement will say, oh yeah, but repentance just means to turn from unbelief to belief. It's not turning from sin. But unbelief is sin. It's rebellion against God. Idolatry is not just unbelief. It's rebellion against God. So yes, they're called to turn away from unbelief because unbelief is sin and rebellion against God. Verse 31. 
See, am I right place here? No, for verse 30. God overlooked the times of ignorance, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, to turn from your idolatry and your wicked unbelief. Verse 31. For he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, having given assurance of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Jesus Christ is the risen judge. He is going to judge every man and give every man according to his deeds. Those who by patience and continuance, by the power of the Holy Spirit, who put sin to death and walk not in perfection, but walk in daily obedience to the Lord. When they fall, they go to the throne of grace. They will receive eternal life. But those that live in rebellion, live according to the flesh, live in this false belief that as long as you believe the right things, then you're going to heaven. They will perish because of their sin and unbelief. So. This is what Paul is talking about when he says, according to my gospel, because this is the gospel he preached, that he will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. So this applies to Christians as much to unbelievers because they are going to be in the grave and be raised up and they are part of every man as this passage was talking about. Let's go on to verse 17. Indeed, you are called a Jew. Now, what he's going to do here is he's going to kind of revert back to the Jews. Now he's going to refer back to the Jews again. He's actually been talking to the Jews the whole time. That's why he brings up the Gentiles. But he's going to talk back to them and say, look, what I began this chapter with, saying that you're condemned because you're impenitent heart, that you're judging other people, but you're doing the same things. He's just going to say the same thing again. So I'm not going to spend too much time. Let's, let's see how it works out here. Verse 17. Indeed, you are called a Jew and rest in the law and make your boast in God. So it's true. Verse 1, therefore you are without excuse, O man. Who is that O man? It's the Jew who rests in the, boasts in the law. You know his will and approve of the things that are more excellent because you are instructed in the law. You are confident that you are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness. So you think that truth is good and wrong things are bad. An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes who have the full content of knowledge and truth in the law. You therefore who teach another, do you teach yourself? You who preach not to steal, do you steal? You who say not to commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? As it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So he's making the same point again. He's saying, look, you think you're righteous just because you have the law. And you condemn all the Gentiles for their idolatry and their sin, but you practice the same things. You are hypocrites, and God, in his patience, has not brought wrath on you. He's left room for you to, to repent, but you have refused to repent. And because of that, you're storing up treasures for yourself on the day of wrath, when you will be the vessels of wrath. This is what Paul is talking about in this chapter. I, I hope we see that so far from verse 1 until now, there's been no break. There's been no point where Paul says, now, okay, this can't happen. Uh, you know, this is just hypothetical. Everything he said is in line with the scriptures, whether 1 John chapter 3 or whether John chapter 5 or John chapter 12 uh, being justified on the last day or being uh, doing good and raising to eternal life. Uh, we've seen this over and over again if we apply it to Christians. And now we're going to get into the fact that's proving to us indeed that's who he's been talking about. Verse 25. Circumcision indeed has merit if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So, if somebody obeys the law of Moses, they must get circumcised, okay? And that's something that they can say, look, I'm part of the people of God. I've obeyed the law of Moses. I've entered into this old covenant. I'm with uh, God in this covenant. But then if they disobey the law, they don't walk in righteousness, they commit adultery, they, they steal from temples, they, they blaspheme, all these kind of things that they do, even though that they're circumcised, it means nothing to God. It doesn't matter that they've done the outward things. It doesn't matter that they go to the temple. It doesn't matter that they say, uh, you know, uh, the temple is among us. The temple is among us. Like they said in Jeremiah's day uh, where, you know, God says, no, I don't care if the temple is among you. I'm still going to destroy it and cast you out. And so all those things don't matter to God. So if somebody is circumcised but they don't keep the law, God counts them as not a Jew. He counts them as not his people. Verse 26. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteousness of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? Now, here we get into the point where Paul, which is what I, I went into death yesterday, and you can look at that video if you're interested, uh, what Paul is saying about the law. In Paul's mind, he has two views of the law. He talks about the law of Moses, and that's what he's talking about. But in the law of Moses, he has two levels. He has the ceremonial part, whatever you want to call it. The Bible doesn't talk about a ceremonial law and a civil law and a moral law. But in the law, we're able to see that sometimes the 
the prophets would condemn people, even though they were keeping the Sabbath, doing the new moons and the festivals and all these things, he would condemn them for not walking humbly, doing justly, and uh, loving mercy. So God's desire is that they walk in those things. They walk in righteousness. They walk in true holiness, humility, uh, uh, grace, and love. If you walk in those things, even though you don't have the ceremonial aspects, things like Sabbath or circumcision or all those things, then God will count you as already among his people. But if you have those outward things, but don't have the righteousness of the law, you don't have the righteous requirements of the law, then you will not be counted his. So here, therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteousness of the law, how could an uncircumcised man keep the law of Moses? Because part of the law of Moses is to be circumcised. If you're not circumcised, you're breaking the law of Moses. But here he makes a separation between circumcision, the outward thing, which he's later going to call the letter of the law, and what is called the righteousness of the law. The thing that the law of Moses was pointing to, it wasn't a perfect law. Yeah, you couldn't commit adultery, but you could marry as many women as you want, and you could divorce them and they could get remarried. But in the law of Christ, that is not the way it is because the law of Christ is the fulfillment. The commands of Jesus Christ are the fulfillment, the righteousness of the law. So those that uh, are not circumcised, in other words, Gentile believers who are not circumcised, but they keep the righteousness of the law, they do the holy commands of God and walk in a pure way, then they will be counted as circumcision. So this is why we go back to verse 13. For the hearers of the law are not justified before God, but the doers of the law. Does he mean those that do the law, the, all the things of the law of Moses? No, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about those that keep the heart, the righteousness of the law. They will be justified on the last day because they will be walking in obedience to Jesus Christ. They will, by the power of the Spirit, be doing good and be raised to everlasting life. Verse 27, will the uncircumcised one who is righteous by nature. Now, okay, going back to uh, verse 14. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature the things contained in the law. They do it by nature. They do the righteousness of the law by nature. What is this nature? This nature we're going to get to is that they have received the Spirit of God. So we understand, uh, because I, I saw some, we've had some good uh, input on the message from yesterday, and some were still kind of unclear about whether verses, you know, uh, maybe verse 12 through 16, or maybe it was verse 14 through 16, were referring to uh, Gentile Christians. But here we have another confirmation. Verse 27. Will the uncircumcised one who is righteous by nature, how is he righteous by nature? Because he's keeping the righteousness of the law. How is he keeping the righteousness of the law? Because in verse 15, the sh they show the work of the law written on their hearts. That means they're in the new covenant and we're going to get to the spirit soon. Will the uncircumcised one who is righteous by nature, if he fulfills the law, not judge you who by the letter of the law and circumcision violate the law? So, they were living according to the letter of the law. They had their Sabbaths, the new moons. They hated the Romans. They hated the Samaritans. They did all these things, but they rejected Christ. They refused to listen to the word of God and submit to his son. And they didn't walk in the righteousness of the law, but instead they walked in the letter of the law. They had the circumcision, but they did not have righteousness. Verse 28. He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is external and in the flesh. Okay? So here he's going to tell us who he's been talking about the whole time. He's going to make it very clear who the people involved in this chapter are. There's those that are under the law that didn't obey it. There's those that are outside the law that sinned against God. And then there's this other group of Gentiles who by nature keep the righteousness of the law and are going to be justified on that day because they're doers of the law, not just hearers of the law. Verse 29, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly and circumcision is of the heart. Remember Ezekiel chapter 36. The promise was that he would give us a new heart, that he would take out the stony heart. By the Spirit, remember that he was going to, by the Spirit, he was going to put a new spirit within us, Jeremiah chapter 31. And not by the letter, his praise is not from men, but from God. It's not from the outward things like circumcision that he can say, I belong to God's people, but it's through the righteousness that he has within by the power of the Holy Spirit that he's walking in the righteous commands of the law. There's one thing I do want to go back and I, I want to point out here. Let's see, where was that? Oh, okay. Verse 12, the verse 13, which is kind of the, the key passage here. For the hearers of the law are not justified before God, but the doers of the law. This is one more thing that we'll close with this. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says the same thing. Again, Paul is just parroting what his master has said. Jesus is talking about false teachers that say that you can live in sin 
that you can live a lawless life as long as you confess Christ and do, uh, you know, as long as you're charismatic and do all kinds of outward things in ministry, you're okay, even though you're living in lawlessness. And he talks about judgment today, that on that day. So uh, he says, not everyone will enter the kingdom. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. So that day is the day of judgment. Verse 22, Lord, Lord. Have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonderful works in your name? But then I will t declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Those Sin is lawlessness. You know, many in the, uh, the Hebraic Roots movement, they will always go to 1 John chapter 3 and say, See, uh, sin is, law is breaking the law. It's sin is lawlessness. Not breaking the law of Moses, but breaking the law of Christ, which Paul is talking about, which Jesus talks about. I mentioned that more in depth in the message yesterday. But here, he goes on and says this. In light of Judgment Day, this is the context of what he's speaking about. Whoever hears these sayings of mine, hears and does them, I will liken to him a wise man who built his house on a rock, and the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. They were hearers and doers of the law. They will be justified. Verse 26, And everyone who hears these things of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and its fall was great. They were hearers only. They didn't do the law of God, as James talks about. Hearers, but not doers of the word. So, when we go back to John, Romans chapter 2, we see very clearly, if we, if we just do a quick run through, verse 1 through 5, or verse 1 through, yeah, 1 through 5, he's talking about the Jews who are in hypocrisy, judging others, even though they have the law of Moses. And then he goes on and he talks about what judgment day is going to be like. It's going to be judged according to our deeds. And he goes all the way through verse 11, talking about the fact that Jew and Gentile are going to be judged in the same way. Every man is going to be judged. Those that have done good will be raised to everlasting life. Those that have done evil will be raised to judgment. There's no category, a believer, unbeliever, every man will be involved in this. Okay, verse 12, and it's not hypothetical because we know Jesus said every man in the grave that those that have done good will be raised to everlasting life. That was not hypothetical, and it includes everyone. Verse 12, as many as have sinned in the law, and it goes on, he talks about the hypocrisy once again of those, the Jews, and he talks about go referring back to the Gentiles from Romans chapter 1, and he says, look, they didn't obey, and they will also be judged outside of the law. For the hearers of the law will be just, are not justified before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. When? It's on the day of judgment because then he goes on to talk about that those that will come before God on the day of judgment, those that have had the spirit of God, their, the, their conscience testifies, uh, 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 confirms that the law of God has been written on their heart and they are coming either with confidence because they have a, a clean conscience before God or they're coming guilty before God and God knows all things. Verse 16, in the day when according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. Then in verse 17 through 24, he reiterates what he's been saying about the Jews in verse 1 through 5, that they were hypocritically judging the Gentiles even though they were practicing the same things. Then verse 25 through 29, he makes it clear in his mind that there is a distinction between the righteousness of the law and the letter of the law, and that God requires us and will judge us according to the righteousness of the law that we do by the Spirit of God as he writes the law of God in our heart, not by the letter of the law that the Jews had, but were rejecting Christ and the Spirit of God. And so we see uh, that the passage is very clear. It, it's not something to be thrown out as hypothetical, and to do that would be a great danger to our, our soul. And it would be dangerous if we teach other people that they are not to live righteous before God because we will stand before God. We will give an account on that day for every idle word that we've done. By our words, we will be justified and by our words, we will be condemned. And we can say the same thing. By our works, we will be justified. That's what Paul said in verse 13. Sounds blasphemous to our Protestant ears, but that's what he says, and it doesn't contradict with what he says later in chapter 3 when he says, Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the works of the law. That is also true because a person is not justified by keeping the law of Moses. They're not in right standing with God by becoming a Jew or by keeping the law, by obeying the law. Those that tell you that if you want to be in right standing with God you need to, and, and you want to have a faith that works through love, you need to obey the law of Moses. They are wrong. Four, there we are not, we conclude that a man is not justified 
justi is justified by faith without the works of the law. You don't have to become a follower of Sabbath, Torah observant, and all of these things in order to be in right standing with God. No, but you do need to obey the law of Christ, the righteous of law, by the power of the Holy Spirit, with the law written on your heart. And you need to go forward day by day, seeking for honor, glory, and immortality, in patience, doing good, so that you receive eternal life, by the grace of God, by his power that works in us, and we work it out. Hope this has been helpful to you. God bless.